Good morning, church. How's it going? I know I'm a few seconds early. I'm sorry. Hey, welcome to White Ash. I just got a few quick announcements for you, and then we're going to get into service. The first service was great. We had a great worship uh, service, and Andy's preaching was great as well. So let's, let's not stick on announcements too long. You all have a bulletin? If you don't, this is what the bulletins look like. They're out front. Uh, a couple things. Uh, we do have some small groups going on tonight, but Richie Vick's small group, if you're a member of Richie Vick's small group, I don't know who's all in there, is not going to be meeting tonight. Uh, he is sick, and so... That one is canceled, just just so you're aware. Uh, we do have that Senior Saints trip coming up this week. So if you're a Senior Saint and you want to go on the trip, they're going down to E-Town. They're probably going to have some fish. It's going to be a great trip, but you need to sign up so they know how many seats they need to have. The sign-up sheet is on the bulletin board in the crossroads uh, there. And so uh, if you're interested in that Senior Saint trip, that is coming up. Also, Awana is going to be starting soon. We're... Uh, Less than a month, I think, from Awana starting. And so if you're interested in helping with Awana, then, uh, and what is Awana? Awana is our, our children's program uh, where it's based on Bible memorization. That is going to be starting soon. There's a meeting. It's going to be next Sunday, the 20th at 5 p.m. So if you're interested in that, uh, see Mr. Eric Holmes, which is in Children's Church right now. But you can see Mr. Eric, or you can come to that meeting. We'd be more than happy. He'd be more than happy to put you to work, I'm sure. Um, what else? What else? Uh, I think they were talking about taking pictures for the church directory, so there's information on that if you need your picture taken or updated for the church directory. And I don't believe there's anything else. Anything else? Just need Pastor Oh, he's in the front. Pastor Andy, I'll give it to you. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, I'm going to have you stand. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Um, hope we had a good start to school this week and uh, expecting good things in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Um, there's a lot of people around the world that are gathered today for the same reason. That's to lift up a name that's above all the other names. Amen. And I'm glad today that we didn't have to journey to a grave. We didn't have to journey... Um, to a place where there's no hope, but our God's alive, and He's present, and He's here, and He's worthy to be praised, amen. And so today, we just invite you, as we begin to sing, let the power of the Holy Spirit speak to your heart, speak to your mind. If you've got a need this morning, I remind you, the altar's open right now, amen. And you won't have to pray alone, we'll pray with you, but I came expecting great things today in the house of God, amen. And so let's lift our name, lift up his name today. Bob Bowles, good to have you back in service this morning, amen. And uh, yeah, we've been praying for that guy and here he is. And we'll just say we prayed for that and we're still praying for you, amen. All right, well let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and honor it is to be in God's house this morning. Lord, we ask and... Lord, that Holy Spirit, that He would fill this room. Lord, Your Word says that You are a very, very present help in time of trouble. You told us that we could boldly approach the throne of grace and ask for help in our time of need. And God, today, we just pray for the power and the anointing Spirit, Lord, to be here in our presence. I pray when we leave here today, we can know that we've been in the presence of the Most High God. Lord, I pray you'd move across these pews. You'd move in families. I pray we'd drop stuff off this morning. I pray, dear God, that through your power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we leave here today, we say we never saw it like that before. I pray, dear God, Lord, you do something special in our midst today. I'm thankful that you're a God who's alive and well, not a God who's dead. You're not a God who can't, you're a God who can. You're not a God who has to, has to deal with the impossible. You're a God who makes all things possible. And so today we just thank you. You're worthy of our praise. Inhabit our praise this morning. In Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen. 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 Come on. Amen. Good morning.
You know, there's a lot of other religions. They don't know where they're going. They don't know what they're doing. Hey, we're going to see the king, amen. Aren't you glad that we know the king today and that he's alive and we get to see him again? Hey, isn't it good to sing this morning with a little bit of swagger? I know the king of the universe. I know the God of the sun, amen. Woo! Let's go see him, amen. What? 
was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chance God, as Pastor said, that we can brag on the King of the universe and we can say that we will soon be seeing Him, Lord. And we thank you for the promise and the hope that you give us, Lord, in that eternal life. And God, we just pray that you would just open us up today, God. We pray for the, the pastor right now. We pray for the words that he's going to speak, Lord. We know it's a powerful word. And God, we just pray that you'd open our ears, Lord, that you'd open our hearts, Lord, that you convict us where we need convicting, Lord, and that you draw us closer to you in areas of our life where we need it, God. And we we need to hear a strong word from you, God, and we just pray that you would just uh, help us to be receptive, God, help us to be willing. In your name we pray. for you. 
have your Bibles this morning, you can turn them to the book of Jude. Jude is in Revelation, or just right before Revelation. So if you get to Revelation, turn one book back. Um, before I get there, I want to tell you just a couple quick things. Um, we did not go to Planned Parenthood or Hope Clinic yesterday. We're going to reschedule that trip soon. However, this past week I talked to Karen Kula. Karen, raise your hand so they can see you. And she has started being one of the uh, sidewalk counselors for the Coalition of Life. Um, she recently sent me an article that was in the USA Today, um, which is a, a national publication, if you don't know what the USA Today is. Um, and essentially, it shared that Carbondale, um, Illinois, has now become one of the abortion capitals of the entire country. Um, it'll soon have its third abortion clinic, um, and they're getting um, pretty much every state south of us is coming to Carbondale now. Um, and the point of the, uh, the, the position of the USA Today was being in the Bible Belt, they wondered why so many people, why, why, why there wasn't more opposition than there actually was. Um, and so, I, Karen, I, I, I talked to her and I said, Karen, what can we do? Because I know, I get it. You got to work, amen? You can't be there every day. What can you do? And so she spends at least one day a week, I think at the Alamo Clinic, which is, if you know where the old Carbondale Clinic is, essentially almost across the street from it on 13. Um, and they, they sidewalk council. Um, in Carbondale, they pass the bubble law, so they have to be so many feet away. Um, and they wear their orange vest, and as people pull in the parking lot, they're able to stop them and tell them the different options that they have. And I, I asked Karen, I said, what, what can White Ash do to help? And she said, more than anything, she said, you can show up. She said, you don't have to talk if you can just show up and encourage and pray. Um, and so she said, even if it's for five minutes, if you're driving by, pull in, there is the ankle and foot center. Dr. Miller, he's a strong Christian pro-life believer. You can park in their parking lot, walk out there and tell the Coalition of Life people, maybe just say, hey, can I pray over you? Maybe bring them a drink or if it's a hot day or a donut or something. Um, but you know what? It feels good when you're in the trenches to have somebody encourage you. Amen. And so I just sharing that with our congregation today you got five minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, you're in Carbondale, drive by there, 
Introduce yourself. Say, I go to White Ash Church. There's a few different of our people that are parts of the Coalition of Life that are serving over there. Um, and so go tell them who you are. Say, I'm from White Ash. I just want to come and pray for you today. Tell you I appreciate what you're doing out here on the sidewalk. Maybe learn a, bit, a little bit more and see what God can do through that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. So we got that. Amen. The book of Jude. Um, Jude writes in Jude chapter 3. He says... Um, or excuse me, the third verse, Jude only has one chapter in it. Um, so obviously we're going to be with that one chapter. Um, so it says, dear friends, I, I have been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation that we all share. Amen? I mean, I can't think of a better thing to write about, can you? Uh, he says, I, I want to share with you and talk to you about the salvation that we all share, the richness of Jesus Christ, that He died for our sins, that He rose from the grave, that through Him we might have life, the good news of Jesus. Amen? And I, I can't thank, praise the Lord for salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Amen? And I, listen, I, listen, I, I, I preached this earlier, and I've got... One little page of notes, and I'm just going to tell you that I feel like this word today is meant for us for this day. Amen? And it's strong, okay? It's strong. And it should be strong. The Word of God needs to be strong. You know, we live in a day and a time where everything is going to hell in a handbasket. Doesn't it seem like it? The whole world's went and got confused. And every day we wake up, and there's more, just for lack of a better term, junk. Just pure nonsense. I mean, it's crazy. The, the world has introduced this word to us. It's the most, it's the awfulest word in the entire dictionary, the word tolerance. How many have ever heard of tolerance? Tolerance, that's horrible. That's not a Christian word. They, they've introduced this word tolerance to us and they, they think, listen, we're supposed to tolerate everything. God's word does not tolerate everything. It doesn't have a middle ground. It, it has one side and the other side. One side is of God and the other side is of the devil. And I want you to know today that there is a fight. I mean an all-out fight for the church of Jesus Christ. And listen, the devil, he's playing for keeps. The Bible says you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And I want you to listen to me today, church. The devil is trying to destroy your life. The enemy is wanting to destroy your church. The enemy is wanting to destroy your marriage. The enemy is trying to destroy your nation. Look at the nation that we live in. Look at the leadership that we have. Is it not crazy? Our leaders can't even walk. They can't even talk right. I mean, seriously, we deserve the judgment of the leadership that we got. In the state of Illinois, our lawmakers just passed a law that you could be an illegal immigrant, not even belong to this country and be a police officer. What kind of craziness is that? We, in our Bible Belt, in our area, we don't even have a right, it seems like, to vote. And everybody up north sends these thinking abortion clinics down here, these murdering mills, and puts them in our town. And they fill our town with all this deceit and debauchery, and we got these leaders around here that approve it. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm so sick and tired of tolerance. Because God's Word does not tolerate this junk. I'm going to tell you a few things you need to know about tolerance today. Are you ready? This is just free, amen? Tolerance is easy. Tolerance is easy. It does not, no thinking is necessary. Whatever you want, there's no risk. Live and let live. Just let everything be okay. But the problem with tolerance is, tolerance doesn't line up with the Word of God. And for a Christian, when you start allowing tolerance to rule over your life, next thing you know, you've crossed boundaries that you shouldn't be crossed. You've negotiated things that were not up for sale. I'm so sick and tired of the word tolerance. Better yet, tolerance, not only is it just easy, tolerance doesn't line up with God's plans at all. Tolerance does not line up with God's plans at all. You know what we went and done? We went and became a bunch of sissies. And I'm telling you, we have sissified America. We have sissified the church. We have sissified men. You say, well, that's sexist. There you go. There you are right there. You say, well, hey, you're a bigot and you're sexist. No, I'm not. I'm biblical. Amen? 
And I'm so, I'm so tired of it. People say, you're mad. No, I'm tired of the devil taking things that he, that he has no right to take. And I'm so sick and tired of the church and the family letting it go. I'm so tired of it being ignored. I'm so tired of people not paying attention. I'm so tired of people not listening. Amen? I'm just, you say, well, what's going on? Hey, tolerance can be adjusted as needed. If you need more tolerance, you turn it up. If you need to get rid of something, by all means, you turn it down. You call that bigoted, narrow-minded, and you get it out of the way. That's what happens. Tolerance. Tolerance allows people to redefine words, and it brings confusion. That's why we don't know whether we're boys or girls. That's why we don't know what the institution of marriage is supposed to look like. That's why churches act silly now and entertain and act crazy. We live in a day and a time we got serious problems all in the name of tolerance. And I'm going to tell you the most thing that is, that, that, that is the least tolerant on the face of the earth is the Word of God. Amen. Amen? Amen? You know what else I'm tired of? I'm tired of the critics. Hey, the church has problems. Do you know that? Amen? I don't need a keyboard warrior telling me that it does. Amen? And there's a lot of people that can, they can be critical and they can sit on the sidelines. But it says something to come in here and be on the team of God. Amen? It's one thing to be sit on the sidelines. It's another thing to be a player. You got me? And I'm going to tell you, church, listen, we're not perfect, but I promise you that we're serving the God who allows us to be, to be unperfect because he came that through him we might have life. Amen? And I'm telling you, I, I'm sick and tired of the critics. Amen? It's easy to criticize. Come on, somebody. Are you all here this morning? Uh, tolerance. It's a cop-out. It's a joke. We have cowered it down. Our lives. And I, the Satan is just taking ground after ground after ground after ground. And I, I'm so... I, listen, the thing is, is that we hear words preached each week. But if you do not... Listen, if you do not take heed the words that are given to you and actually act on them, then that's all they are, are words. Amen? I, I, I was talking earlier. At this altar right here, in the past several years, in the past 15 years, I've led a lot of people to the Lord right here. I mean, and, and some of you are here to, Tracy, I can remember right there leading you to the Lord. I remember others, that, man, I haven't heard hide or hair of them since that day. Now when I pray over people right here at this altar, you know what I tell them before they get up? I say the proof will be in the pudding. Because anybody can say a prayer. Anybody can say I'm sorry. But God wants a fully committed life for him. He wants somebody who will get up day in and day out and follow the Word of God. He wants somebody to get up day in and day out and be the man or woman of God he's supposed to do, not negotiate the principles, not give in, not give way, but to stand up and be counted for. And I just, we live in a day and a time where we've negotiated everything and people ask, how do we get here? We got us here. We did. This nation is in the shape that it's in because the church is in the shape that it's in. The church is in the shape that it's in because homes or families are in the shape that they're in. Families are in the shape that they're in because mom and dads are in the shape that they're in. It didn't happen overnight. It wasn't an accident. Somebody laid down on the job and the enemy came in in his deceptive ways. He started to take territory. And before you know it, we look like we're crazy. We don't know up from down, left from right, right from wrong. We don't know what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. We sit and we preach about all the things in the world. But what about the things in our life? Listen, if we're going to get somewhere, we're going to have to get immorality out of our life. You know what? God can't stand homosexuality. You know what else? He can't stand lying. Amen? He can't stand envy and jealousy. He can't stand bad stewardship. He can't stand the hatred that we have in our hearts. He can't stand pornography. He can't stand sexual immorality. He can't stand sex outside of marriage. He can't stand cursing. He can't stand those jestful jokes. He can't stand lust. And I'm going to tell you, church, we're really good about pointing the finger when God's house needs to clean up. Amen? It's the things we ignore about in our families. Hey, we don't want to talk about them. But all of them are going on. And you ask ourselves, when are we going to experience God? When are we going to see breakthroughs? When are we going to see changes? When the house of God comes clean. Because the enemy is coming in. And whether you like it or not, he is marching all over your face. And right now, currently, he is winning. Hey, this country which we live in, this is it. 
This is the last stand. Have you looked around the world? Most places are not even effectively at all ministering for the gospel of Christ. This is the last freedom's last stand. We're the freest people that have ever lived on the face of the earth. You have more rights, more freedoms than anybody. And what do we do with them? We spend half the time on these stinking phones. We spend hours on this. They, they, they run our lives. If we leave home and forget it, we'll turn around and go get it. These are sitting on our bookshelves. You never pick them up. We're the most illiterate people in the Word of God than ever before. We spend less time praying than ever before. We spend hours watching stinking screens and playing games. The enemy's winning. And I'm telling you, church, it's time to get stirred about it. And if you don't admit it, you say, well, pastor, and listen, take that nonsense somewhere else. I'm going to tell you, people got to, we got to sound a wake up call. There's some things happening that the church of Jesus Christ needs to know about. Amen. All right, here we go. Come on, stay with me. Dear friends, I have been eagerly planning to write to you about salvation we all share. He says, but now I, 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 I must write about something else. Urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. So he says, I, I would love to talk to you about salvation. I would love to share with you the secrets of the cross. I would love for us to focus on the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But instead, I'm going to have to talk to you about the defending of the faith. And he's going to tell us because there's some people that have came in. And they're beginning to sink and get in, in the church. And look what he says. He said, I, I, saw, I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. Let me say it a little bit louder for those in the back. God's grace allows us to live immoral lives. In other words, because God loves us so much, it gives me a reason I can live any way that I want to live. I can talk any way that I want to talk. I can do anything I want to do. I've said a prayer and I'm good to go. That's a lie from the pits of hell. God demands something out of you. God demands men and women of God live and breathe holy lives. That we would walk according to the standards of God. That we would speak to others according to the standards of God. That we would love our, our spouses. That we would love our children. That we would love our neighbors. That we would honor God. The church is filled up with immorality. We look like the world, smell like the world, act like the world. But God's word says be different from the world. We go and we, we no longer live these, 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 these lifestyles. And we think to ourselves, well it's only those folks, these people. But we're ate up with it. Sex before marriage. Church doesn't even think about it anymore. No problem. God calls it immorality. He calls it, and he abhors it. He hates it. We glorify everything and we don't say a word about it. Well, he's not talking about us. After all, we're not homosexual or transgender. There's more than two sins in God's word. We live lives addicted to pornography. We live lives in front of our children in drunkenness and hatred. We spend time in gossip and jestful words. We're consumed with the things of the world. We talk more about our neighbors than we do the word of God. We are filled with immorality. The church has got issues. Church has got problems. And the enemy is wearing us out. He's coming into pews. He's coming into homes. He's standing into pulpits. And it's time the people of God started being the people of God. Acting like the people of God. Lifting up the people of God. We have more Bibles than we ever had. And we, we know least about the Bible than we ever did. We're biblically illiterate. We want to use it as our sword and weapon. We don't even know what the 66 books of the Bible are. And we use cop-outs like I don't have that good of a memory. We'll remember how to turn on phones. Amen. We'll remember what somebody said on Facebook six weeks ago. We'll chase down this and we'll chase down that. You know what we're doing? We're copping out. We're becoming sissified. We don't care anymore. And I'm going to tell you. The enemy, he has taken territory that 
he shouldn't be allowed to have. And so Jude, he's writing to this church of Jesus, and he said, man, I would love to talk to you about salvation, but I can't do that because there's some that are worm their way into churches and pews and pulpits, and all they do is sit and accuse the brethren, and the brethren fall right into their traps of lies. They begin to rub off on them. Well, so-and-so's doing it, so it must be all right. Well, so-and-so's doing it, so it must be fine. And all of a sudden, immorality begins to spread like a Russian olive in an open field. And it covers, covers and takes territory back like vine. It grabs on to everything that it possibly can. We are today because we have given up things that we should have never given up. And I don't know about y'all, and I've preached it before, but I'm so tired. I'm so tired of the enemy winning. Now listen, I know as well as you do, that the enemy is defeated. But right now he's winning. Right now he's winning. He's winning in families. He's winning in friendships. He's winning in marriages. He's winning in children. He's winning in, 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 in your own personal lives. We're, listen, he, he brings on depression, brings on anxiety, brings on worry, brings on fear. He breaks down everything that God builds up. He's a destroyer. Know your enemy. Look what the Bible says. He says they want to live. They want to be touched by the grace of God, but they want to live immoral lives. But by the way, the Bible says, but from the book of Paul, or book of Romans, Paul says, if we continue in sin that grace may abound, God forbid. Braxton, what's going on, brother? Kai, I'm sorry. They look so much alike. <laughs> look what the Word of God says. So he says, so I want to remind you, though you already know these things, he wants to remind us that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, but later he destroyed it for those who did not remain faithful. I want to remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. So in two situations, God, God who, those who thought they were holy but failed to remain faithful, God brought judgment upon them. Look at the third one. And don't forget about Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of eternal life of God's judgment. In the same way, these people who claim authority from their dreams, they live immoral lives, they defy authority, they scoff at supernatural beings. Even Michael, one of the mightiest of angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people scoff at the things they do not understand. Like unthinking animals, they do what even their instincts tell them, so they bring about their own destruction. What sorrow awaits them? For they follow in the footsteps like Cain who killed, who killed his brother. Like Balaam they deceive people for money. And like Korah they perish in the rebellion. When these people eat with you in your fellowship meals commemorating the Lord's love, they are like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you. They are like shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. They are like clouds blowing over the land without giving any rain. They are like trees in the autumn. They are doubly dead. They bear no fruit and have been pulled up by the roots. They are like wild waves of the sea churning up foam of their shameful deeds. They are like wandering stars doomed forever to the blackest darkness. Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation after I, Adam prophesied about these people. He said, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of His holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things that He has done and for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against Him. These are the grumblers, complainers, living only to satisfy their desire. They brag loudly about themselves and they flatter others to get what they want. But I want to tell you today about three ways that He tells us to defend the faith. Three ways to start taking back territory that Satan has given up. Three ways to get back what Satan is trying to steal from you and your family. And when I speak about this morning, I want you to think about it in the context of your marriage, your family, 
your church, your nation. Can you do that with me? So think if you could do these things in each of those contexts, how would it help you to, def- to overcome the enemy, to overcome the things in which you're facing? Because the church of the living God has a real problem about ignoring the problem. Are you with me? We have a real problem about ignoring the problem. Let's read. Here we go. Y'all with me? But you, my dear friends, you must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you that in the last days, the last times, there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people, these ones, are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. In other words, Satan's army. He's implored them under the world. They cause division. They cause turmoil. They cause confusion. Amen? You want to destroy a group. You want to destroy a marriage. You want to destroy a relationship. All you got to do is cause resistance in the middle of it. Get them fighting with one another. Get them mad at one another. Don't get them unified. Get them quarreling at one another. Get them criticizing one another. Are y'all with me? Uh, hey, you want to destroy marriage? Get the wife criticizing the husband. Get the husband criticizing the wife. Next thing you know, they ain't even talking to each other anymore. Next thing you know, they're not sleeping in the same room. He ain't good enough. She ain't good enough. Next thing you know, there's a hole split right down the middle of that family. They don't have a father. They don't have a mother. And everything's gone to chaos and Satan's sitting over there laughing. Are you with me, amen? I'm just, I'm just saying. Here we go. Are y'all ready? But you... But you, dear friends. And he gives us three things. Now listen, take these three things this morning. The first thing, must build each other up in your most holy faith. In other words, listen, you must build each other up in your most holy faith. Now the opposite of build up is what? Tear down. The opposite of build up is what? Tear down. Now most of the time, You guys correct me if I'm wrong. These are conversations that we ignore. We don't talk about them. I mean, do we ever go to our spouse and we say, hey, how's your faith going? How are things between you and God? What are you struggling with? If I went to Stephanie and said, Stephanie, well, what are you struggling with spiritually? Well, what kind of word have you been in today? Well, what are you battling? What are you tempted by? And I started to build up her faith. I started to share the word of God with her. Not every now and then, but every day. What if each day I focused on spiritually building up my spouse? What if each day I encouraged her in the faith? I didn't ignore it. It's just not something that we go and do on Sunday. But all of a sudden our faith becomes part of our reality. What are you studying in the Word of God? What are you battling? What are your weaknesses? What are your heartaches? What are your desires? Let me help you, girl. I want to build up your faith. What if we went to our children? Hey, because you know what? The enemy's going to your children. They know their weaknesses. Before I move on to children, wives... What do you go to your husbands and say, husbands, what are you stressing about? What are you afraid of? What are you feeding on the Word of God in? What are you learning about God? What if we started building each other up in the faith? Do you think your household would change? Do you think your marriage would change? Hey, there's four reasons. I, I, I counsel people before they get married. And I've learned in my 15 years, that there's four reasons why people get divorces. Family. Okay, either the family they have or the families they came into marriage with. Money, they, got, they usually have separate bank accounts or they argue over money. They don't have right, the good spending practices. They, they are, money becomes an issue. Religion, which is kind of the obvious. And the last one is sex. Every one of them have elements of faith in them. Did you know that? that all of them have biblical dynamics that have talked about constructively in a marriage would improve the marriage. But we don't build each other up in the faith. 
We just ignore the problem. We think, well, hey, pastor, pray for my marriage. Well, what about it? Well, it just ain't good. Well, what are you doing to make it better? You've got to build up in the faith. Amen. Hey, your kids, the enemy is coming after your children. Them stinking cell phones, they're the worst things ever. I'm just telling you, they are, they are pure hell. They are Satan's tactics. They are destroying lives. This social media thing, I'm telling you. Listen, I, I, listen, Jack, he's the only one I got under control now, but I'd never have a child have social media. When they, get it, when they get old enough, they do whatever they want to do, but I'm telling you, there is stuff in there their brains can't handle. Just can't handle it. My brain can't handle it half the time. I'm just telling you. They're, they're destroying your kids' minds. They are, they are aiming for their weaknesses. And you know what? By and large, most parents, we do not have spiritual conversations with our kids. We don't ask them, how are you growing in the faith? We lead them to a prayer and we say, praise God, little Tommy got saved. He got baptized. We called it in. We've had pictures. How are you growing your children in the faith? Because I know how Satan's destroying them. He knows them by name. He knows their weaknesses. Moms, dads, have spiritual conversations. Son, daughter, what are you struggling with? What are you looking at? What kind of weaknesses do you have? Build each other up in the faith. Hey, how about in this room? Have you ever had a conversation with somebody? Not about the cardinals, not about hunting, not about the weather, but about spiritual things. In this room, have you looked over somebody and built them up in the faith? What are you facing? What are you struggling with? Do you think the church would be stronger if we built each other up in the faith? I do. Do you think our families and marriages would be stronger if we build each other up in the faith? Do you think our kids would have easier times if we build up each other in the faith? Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. I, I know you're wanting to say, well, what's wrong with this guy today? Listen, the enemy's taking territory. He's sitting in your lap. And you know what? By and large, we ignore him. What about in our nation? If we started building people up in the faith, do you think our nation could change? I do. So not only does it say that we need to build each other up in the faith, look what number two says there. <laughs> it says we should pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the Bible says in Romans 8 that when you don't, you ever, you ever not known how to pray? In Romans 8, it says, when you don't know how to pray, the Spirit will pray on your behalf. Now listen, th think about this. Now, I, I said this before, but forget, listen, I, I know we're really good at good God, good meat. Amen? I know we're really good at Lord, lay me down to sleep. I know we're really good at Lord, bless me. But we're not really good at praying with the power of the Spirit. I was thinking as, hey, uh, D, you're going to sing that song in invitation again. But I was thinking about what she was seeing. I pray for your, your healing. I, I, I pray for a breakthrough that would happen today. I, I pray that circumstances would change. I mean, you can't pray about a circumstance if you don't know about a circumstance. You can't pray for a breakthrough unless you know what somebody needs to break through. When you start praying in the power of the Holy Spirit, you've had a moment of building somebody up in the faith that you can share and then you can take the Spirit of God and say, Lord, I'm praying for this person to have a breakthrough that their circumstance would change, that they'd have healing, they'd have victory in their family, victory in their marriage, victory in their children, victory in their churches. Come on, somebody. I mean, I'm talking powerful prayer. Earth-shaking prayers. Could you imagine? Hey, if I stopped praying for this woman to have a good day, and she, I knew her weaknesses, and I started praying with the power of Holy Spirit in our life, God, I pray, Lord, that you'd do a work in Stephanie. God, that you'd make her an ambassador. That you'd give her the confidence that she needs. God, that you would fill her up with the power of your spirit. I pray, God, when she walk, word of God would come in remembrance of her. Lord, I pray you help her, help her overcome her struggles and her battles. And man, I started praying directly at the enemy. Lord, remove her fear. Remove her worry. Give her victory. Change the circumstance. Change the situation. Amen? Hey, what if you knew a couple who was struggling? I mean, somehow, some way. Could you imagine? Think about this right now. Could you imagine if you're struggling in your marriage today and you knew that tonight a saint of God 
If you knew that here in a few moments a saint of God was going to start praying over you, not in their power, but in the power of the one who created the Son, but in the power of the one who rose it up this morning, in the power of the one who said the ocean could come this far, the power of the one who raises the dead to life. Could you imagine if you had a born-again child of God filled with the Holy Ghost that started interceding for your marriage? Do you think something could happen? Amen. Do you think circumstances could change? Do you think there could be a breakthrough? Do you think the enemy could go running? Hey, listen, don't get stirred, okay? I, amen? I, I'm just saying, I wonder what could happen, amen? Could you imagine when those sweet children that you love so dearly, when they head out each day, you've prayed over them, with the power of the Holy Spirit. You've covered them. Not asked for them to have a good day. You've asked for them. God, give them a hunger and thirst for righteousness. God, help them to hate sin. God, if they need convicted, convict them. Grow them into the men and women of God. Help them to love your word. Help them to be a leader amongst their peers. Help them to be examples to their friends and co-workers. Lord, when everybody else curses, let your, Lord, let my child not curse. When everybody else takes your name in vain, let my child be the one that says it's wrong. Lord, let my child stand for the things of God. Lord, when everybody else is negotiating their faith, give them the strength and the wisdom to say no. Lord, root them deep. God, when the winds and waves of this society come and the words of tolerance are throwing them around, let him say, no! God, I, I, man, I could do some praying. Amen. Lord, let's build up the faithful. Let's pray according to the Spirit of God. And thirdly, thirdly, are you ready? Let's... Let's await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad about mercy? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Uh, some of you do, some of you don't. There's something powerful about mercy, isn't there? Man, how many of you have done stuff that you just, man, you would be so embarrassed if we could stand up and there'd be light bulbs over your head and you saw it? John, thank you for raising your hand. Jack was the only one who raised his hand earlier. He was sitting in that spot. That spot must be anointed. I'm... Have you ever done things that are so stupid? Amen? I mean, I just think to myself, man, I, I'm so glad that I got a God who forgives. I mean, I think of the things I've done, the embarrassments that I've had. And man, when you really, forget, uh, when you really receive forgiveness for the things that you've done, I mean, you really get it. Man, there's freedom, isn't there? I mean, just freedom. Not, not just because you're, you're sorry, but because you've experienced the goodness of God. Paul said, I, I don't do the things that I should do, and I, I do the things that I shouldn't do. Throughout Scripture, we had a law that no man could keep. That's why Jesus came that... He's the only one who could do it. All of us, we need mercy. Something about experiencing mercy. See, I, I think in this day and time, mercy's not a word that we throw out enough. We're quick to kick somebody when they're down. We're quick to not show grace or compassion. We're quick to talk about, call somebody, you'll never believe what so-and-so did. Can you believe it? They won't be back. But for the mercy of God. I, I think about what, what, what happens and we have this great need today for mercy. I, I need it. I, throughout the years, I've seen 
people experience mercy at different times. Um, Micah six eight, which is Caleb's life verse. Love. What is it? How does it go, Caleb? Seek justice. Yeah, Caleb's made that his life verse. He he said it in his senior speech or whatever he had to do, put it in his yearbook. I remember Caleb specifically a time in his life when he tasted mercy. Um, anybody who's been around the church for very long knows I use Caleb and Jack a lot. I won't go too, into too much of the details here. Um, but Caleb had had a traffic accident. How many of you have ever had a traffic accident? Amen. Caleb had a fair share. So did I when I was his age. And um, he got a ticket on this one. You remember it, Caleb? Yeah. And i got to be honest with you, I was mad at Caleb. I was mad not for a week. I was mad for like months at him. I just looked at him. <laughs> and so finally this, this court case came. And listen, when you have a child who's under 18 and you've got to take him to court, they have a special day for you. Michael, you were there that day. Yeah. We walked in, me and Michael, we sat together. He's with Taylor, I'm with Caleb. And so we're sitting in there, and man, I'm just like, gosh. I was like, man, I, 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 I'm so mad. I, I said, Caleb, I hope they throw the book at, the, at you. They might put you in jail. <laughs> uh, he's sitting there, and he's nervous. He's worried, and he saved up so much money, how much money to pay the ticket, and how much other money. You, you know what I mean? It's, it's probably three, $400 dollars time it's all said and done. And I ain't paying a dime. You know, I'm done. You ever parents ever get there like, hey, I'm done. I was done. Rob's like, yep. Amen. And so we're sitting there and they finally call Caleb's name. The parent can't go up there. They just got to be present. And so we're sitting back there and this attorney's up there and he's district assistant, whatever. He comes up to Caleb and he says, Caleb, how far are you from turning 18? He said, I'm about a month away, sir. He said, you've never had a ticket? Well, I got to thinking about Caleb's had a lot of accidents, but he's never had a ticket. I mean, Scott free record. He's like, no, sir, no, I never have. I was like, yeah, like Mr. Perfect's up there. <laughs> he says, well, what'd you do? He said, I pulled out in front of somebody. Huh. The guy looks at me and says, you know what? He said, just put your money away. Look, judge, let's just dismiss the case. Excuse me, Judge. I object. <laughs> he walks out of there, got a wad of cash in his pocket because he's been saving for the last three months. Before. Comes in and we get in the car. And Caleb looks over at me. And for the first time in his life, I've seen the seriousness of it. Because see, Caleb can be a big old Harry, 18 year old. But that day he wasn't. He had these big old crocodile tears. And he said, Dad, I think I just experienced God's mercy. Dad, I love mercy. And I'm going to tell you something in our lives, there's sometimes we got ourselves into situations that we should have never been in. But His mercy, it extends, it endures. It doesn't give you a license to stay there. But it gives you freedom from it. And some of you here today are carrying stuff around that you've done in years past that has haunted you. That you need a breakthrough from. That you need deliverance from. That you need victory from. You've got bitterness, unforgiveness. You've got a victim mentality. It's everybody else's fault. And there's a mercy, that a fountain that you can sit under this morning that can set you free. And I'm going to tell you that in moments where the enemy is taking territory and he is destroying, I tell you, seek out the mercy of God. God didn't call you to live there. He didn't call you to live in it. He called you to have victory. 
He called you to be holy. He called you to be a child of the Most High God. And I'm telling you, the enemy has got you burdened and sunk there and says you're going to be there the rest of your life. And you negotiate principles daily that you never should. But God says, love mercy and await the goodness of God. Man, I wish this church would experience it. Amen. I wish this church would experience it. I'm almost done. Darren, I want you to come. Jill, you come. Deidre, you come. Everybody else come. Andy, how we not know this? Uh, I know. Snuck up on me too. Um, Tony, can you stand up for me? Tony, can you stand up? How old are you, Tony? 81. 81. Do you feel 81? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Tony, what year were you born? 1942. Tony, when you were growing up and even as a young adult, do you know what the most popular television show was? Well, amen. When you did, do you know what the popular television show was? The Andy Griffith Show. You ever seen the Andy Griffith Show? It had Andy. It had Barney. You, you know anybody reminds you of Barney? Bar- never mind. Um, Andy Griffith Show, it was full of godly morals, godly values. They didn't use curse words. Um... It had a sense of holiness to it. But the Bible says in the last days that scoffers will come in. You sit back down, Tony. You can sit back down. Um, I, I was born in 1980. Do you know what the most popular television show was when I grew up? The Cosby Show. I remember the Cosby Show. Man, I loved it. I loved it. Both successful parents. The house was ran. Mom and dad complimented each other. Church, they went to church on Sunday. They taught their kids great morals and great values. You remember this? They ate dinner around the table. Yes! Amen? Come on, somebody. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, Michael, stand up. What year were you born? 91. 91. You know what the most popular TV television show was when Michael grew up? A show called Seinfeld and Friends. Have you ever seen it? Come on. It's okay. We've we've seen every episode, Steph and I. And you know, we went from honoring God to six people who tried to hook up constantly with other people. Who glorified perverse things. And you know what? All in the name of humor, we thought, man, that's great. And we laughed and we can quote the episodes and we can quote the shows. And something happened because the enemy started working his way in. And I'm going to tell you, I was watching it the other day. I, I ain't lying to you. It, it playing in our house. And I got to thinking, there ain't a more godless show on TV than that friend show. I mean, if you think about the things that they, they talk about. It's crazy. You can sit back down, Michael. Caleb, stand up. Caleb was born in 2004. You know what the most popular TV show was when he was growing up? The Modern Family. Now they've taken mom and dad out replaced them with homosexuals. Do you see what happened? You see, hey, do you see where we're at? But I'm going to tell you, I think things could change. I think we could conquer some things. If we start building up each other in the faith, if we start praying with the power of the Holy Spirit, and when we start recognizing the mercy that God has for us, if we would stop playing tolerance, stop being cowards, stop being sissified, Start taking back what's been stolen from us. Dee's going to come in a moment and sing this song. I pray for a breakthrough. That circumstances would change. And today I'm going to ask you if you would to bow your heads and close your eyes. How many of you say, Pastor Andy... That's me this morning. There's some things that I've got to build up the faith with. I've got to be the mom or dad that that I need to be, the husband or the wife. Come on, lift your hands up. Come on, it should be everybody in this room. How many of you say, Pastor Andy, I heard the word that you preached this morning. Come on, lift it up. Because it's not a word for some, it's a word for all. 
How many of you right now, you have a circumstance, come on, or a situation, a need, a breakthrough that needs to happen, where you don't need to pray, I mean, you need to pray with the power of the Holy Spirit, amen? How many of you today, Pastor Andy, I've made decisions that I should have never made, I've done things that I should have never done, I need some mercy this morning. Come on, lift it up, I see it. Under the sound of my voice right now, you know what I invite you to do for everybody who lifted hands? Would you just come to the altar? Maybe you just want to grab your family. Maybe you just want to come yourself. But I'm going to tell you right now, in the power of Jesus, would you just come? Would you start coming? Would anybody leave their, leave their seats right now and just say, i got to come? There's some coming. I invite you to come. Heavenly Father, God, we give this time of invitation to you. God, I pray for a breakthrough. I pray for circumstances. God, I pray there be changes in Jesus' name. God, I pray we see captives set free. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
your feet if you like. Morning. Go ahead and stand up, church. Stand up. If you need prayer this morning, I want you to come on up. If there's a need you have, I want you to come on up. bow our heads, close our eyes just for a moment more. I just wonder in a room this size, if there's anybody just holding out. I'm battling this morning, Pastor Andy. Listen, I, I wouldn't dream of calling you out. I just, if you just lift your hand from your seat, I just want to pray for you in my spirit this morning. Would you just lift your hand? I'm battling, Pastor. I see it. I see it. Come on. Who else? I see it. Come on. I see that one. Hey, would you all do me a favor? Just where you're at. Just keep your heads bowed. And let's just pray. Let's just pray together right now. Heavenly Father, God, I feel your presence in this room. God, we need you. We need your power. We need your grace. God, we need you bad. Lord, I know the battles that are taking place throughout this place. God, there's people who are battling family issues, battling financial circumstances, battling addiction. Lord, we got problems with children. God, our jobs. We got all types of different things. 
God, I know that there are some in here that are battling sin and they are so overwhelmed by it. God, I, I pray right now, Lord, for each person in this room, especially for those who have their hands lifted. God, I pray through the power of Holy Spirit, Lord, that you just touch their lives. God, that you convict where you need to convict. That you give them wisdom to walk how they should walk, discern how they should discern. God, I pray favor, grace, mercy, encouragement. And God, I just pray, Lord, for a breakthrough, for a change. God, may in the midst of their trial, may they learn greater dependence upon you. And God, we thank you for being God in moments just like this. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All hearts and minds clear this morning. Amen. All right, Greg, lift those lights up for us. It's been good to be in the house of God today. Amen. Amen. A lot of stuff going on. And so, hey, we'll go out rejoicing. Amen. Hey, remember, the enemy is wanting. He's contending. Defend the faith. Build somebody up. Pray. Wait mercy. Amen. All right. Hey, um, Today's Lighthouse Sunday. If you'd like to give to the Lighthouse Shelter, there's a little lighthouse out there. You can put stuff in. We do have all kinds of small groups going tonight, so remember those. Um, we do have prayer tomorrow night, 6.30. Love to have you out for that. Um, good night in the Lord always. Amen. All right. Brother Dottie Moore, Jordan trying to hide you back here, isn't he? Yeah. Hey, Donnie, you pray us out today, bud. Thank you.